See you. 
put me to what you will. Let me be full or be empty. As long as life and joy. I am no longer mine but yours. Put me to what you will. Let me be full or be empty. As long as Rank me with who?
Welcome to the service of worship with the North Kent Methodist Circuit. I'm Bonnie Bell Pickard, and I welcome you to our worship here on Covenant Sunday 2024. Covenant Sunday, we celebrate each year, as Wes and John Wesley, our founder, instructed us to do as a time to remember the faithfulness of God and our faithful covenant with God. These words from the Methodist worship book. The emphasis of the whole service is on God's readiness to enfold us in generous love, not dependent on our deserving. Our response, also in love, springs with penitent joy from thankful recognition of God's grace. The covenant is not just a one-to-one -one personal relationship, transaction between individuals and God, but the act of the whole faith community. And so we are glad to be able to share this with you, though we're not with each other in person, yet we can have this opportunity. We will begin with singing Great is Thy Faithfulness, which speaks of God's faithful to, to us through all generations. Let's sing together.
Yes, great is God's faithfulness through all generations. We're going to be using the Methodist worship book, which many of you will be familiar with, to go through the liturgy of the covenant service. Let us pray. Glory to the Father, the God of love, who created us, who continually preserves and sustains us, who has loved us with an everlasting love and given us the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Blessed be God forever. Glory to Jesus Christ, our Savior, who, though he was rich, yet for our sake became poor and was tested in every way as we are, yet without sin, who proclaimed the good news of the kingdom and was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, and was raised from the dead and is alive forever and has opened the kingdom of heaven to all who trust in him, who is seated at God's right hand in glory and will come to be our judge. Blessed be God forever. Glory to the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, by whom we are born into the family of God and made members of the body of Christ, whose witness confirms us, whose wisdom teaches us, whose power enables us, who can do for us more than we can ask or think. Blessed be God forever. To the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be praise and glory forever. Amen. God of grace, through the mediation of your Son, you call us into a new covenant. Help us, therefore, to draw near with faith and join ourselves in perpetual covenant with you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The covenant service involves several readings from the Old Testament and the New Testament. I've chosen two to focus on for today. And so we will hear first from Jeremiah 31. Verses 31 to 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel in the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts. And I shall be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. From that reading, we also we already get a sense of the covenant as, that continues to evolve through the years of the the faithfulness of God remains the same, but sometimes the, the way the covenant is made is changed. And we'll be thinking a little bit more about that um, in a few moments. But for now, let's sing together. Lord, you have my heart. Lord, you have my heart. And I will search for yours Jesus, take my life and lead me on oh, Lord, you have my heart And I will search for yours Let me be to you a sacrifice I will search for yours Let 
And then this reading from Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And again, of time of music, we will listen and perhaps sing together to this hymn, Beyond These Walls of Worship.
At the beginning of the covenant service, there are these words, which we'll say again later, but I always think when I read them each year, mm, I need to go back and, and work through that again. And so I will be doing that this year, but hear the words first. God made a covenant with the people of Israel, calling them to be a holy nation, chosen to bear witness to his steadfast love by finding delight in the law. The covenant was renewed in Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his life, work, death, and resurrection. In him, all people may be set free from sin and its power and united in love and obedience. In this covenant, God promises new life in Christ for us. For our part, we promise to live not for ourselves, but for God. We meet, therefore, as generations have met before us to renew the covenant which bound them and binds us to God. Words that particularly struck my imagination as I was reading through this year are these words, the covenant and chosen or chosenness and holiness. Starting with covenant, the word, of course, means an agreement between two parties, that those two parties will support and defend and protect each other, that they will walk together and have a, a faithful relationship with each other. Sometimes these covenants were made between two equal parties, one, and sometimes between the stronger and a, and a weaker party, as it were. The covenant gives responsibility to both parties, and it needs then for, therefore, to be renewed regularly, each side recognizing their part. Of course, in this covenant between us and God, it's not two equal partners, but it's God in God's sovereignty, God's might, God's strength, and us in our weakness, but also understanding what strengths we have, those strengths given to us by God. The original covenants were in the uh, Judeo-Christian understanding were between God and the people of Israel. They were made between with God in particular persons who were leaders, uh, first with Noah, then with Abraham, with Moses, with David. And as we've heard, uh, then modified again, and understanding with the prophet Jeremiah. In simple terms, the covenant with Noah was about God never, God promising never again to destroy the earth or to seek to destroy its creatures. Because God had recognized Noah's faithfulness. And God was also found that he realized that God had created the earth and God loved the earth and its people and he didn't want to destroy it he just wanted us to be in right relationship with God the Abrahamic covenant uh, was about God granting Abraham descendants and here again we hear about being God's people which is a little different than the um, Noah's covenant with all of creation. In this covenant with Moses as well, God promised to take the Hebrew people out of enslavement in, Israel, in Egypt into the promised land. So there's something about providing a place for God's people. But this is also the covenant that was established with the Ten Commandments, which Moses received from God. Those commandments setting the boundaries for how we are to behave with God, how we are to honor and relate to God. So commandments as in ways, rules that we are to follow, as well as the promise that God will provide for us. And then there was a the covenant that God made with David, which was about ensuring a future Messiah to rule God's people with justice, with peace. And that's the covenant that uh, we Christians have, have continued to understand um, in the person of Jesus Christ. There was also the covenant, as we've heard from Jeremiah, about how God would put the covenant within our individual hearts. And of course, as I said, that as Christians, we understand that this covenant was again renewed through Jesus Christ. 
and that we, his followers, also are part of this long line of covenant. In each of these, the understanding is that God would be there for God's people, would provide for God's people, and that the people would honor God and follow God's ways of justice and peace. In each of these covenant relationships, there were times of great difficulty. In essence, as the song goes, God never promises us a rose garden. But God does promise and God has shown God's self to be faithful during the difficult times. The record from scripture is that God indeed is faithful, even when God's people repeatedly turn away. Because, a, again, a covenant is based on both parties' allegiance, it needs to be reviewed regularly. And that's what we would do with this covenant. A second word to explore briefly is this word chosen. And in the covenant understanding, the Jewish people and then we Christians have understood ourselves to be chosen by God. That could mean that we're such special people that God has no other <coughs> chosen people. <coughs> I remember though the, the words from Tevia in um, Fiddler on the Roof, he says, Yes, God, we were your chosen people, but couldn't you choose someone else for a while? Because sometimes those chosen periods seem to be very difficult. I've been reading a book recently called Amazing Grace by author Kathleen Norris, and she has some other um, thoughts about this. She's wondering if being a chosen people means that we're some are chosen and some are not. Often that's the impression that uh, we have. Indeed, in some of the, the Jewish understanding, the Jews were chosen and the Gentiles were not, which made one group enemies with the other in, in essence. And we're currently seeing that played out in catastrophic proportions in the conflict between Israel and the Palestine, the Palestinians in, in Gaza. We can't say it's just the Jews, though, because we Christians have often thought about um, the theory of, of predestination or even of damnation to hell and saying some are some are okay and others are not. Some are chosen and some are not. Basically, it's not that God chooses us because God thinks we're that special. Yes, each of us is unique. Each of us is precious to God. But God loves all God's children. And indeed, God chooses to be in relationship with all of, all of us. But it's up to us whether or not we're going to choose to be in partnership, in, co in um, a covenant relationship with God. In our, co in our contemporary world, many have opted out of such a covenant. Many claim that perhaps God hasn't supported or protected them in the past. So why should they um, be in covenant with God? They will also point out that their own suffering is proof that God is not able to do what God says. <coughs> as if as if God were all powerful, so to prevent them from any suffering. But that misses the essence of the covenant is that God suffers with us. And indeed, all of those people in the in the Bible stories that God has called chosen. For people who suffered as well. Again, Kathleen Norris says that perhaps God chooses to employ our weaknesses rather than our strength and uses our failures more than our successes. So we look at Abraham and Sarah, we look at Moses and Jacob and Ruth and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Mary and Jesus. And we see each of them wrestling with the hard realities of incorporating the divine into their human life. As Kathleen Norris says, contending with hard questions, with thankless tasks, and usually a harrowing journey, which in Jesus' case leads to the cross. So perhaps our chosenness is not so much an honor, but a responsibility, a challenge. And again, in our Christian understanding, it's open. It's an open invitation to all who are willing to accept. <clears throat> I 
another misunderstanding of covenant perhaps is that Israel and we as well have often thought this covenant to mean that we could do whatever we like and God will bless that. Well, it doesn't exactly work like that. God calls Israel, God calls us to be a holy nation, a holy people. That is people who honor all that is good and right and true. The goodly things that are at the base, the root, the essence of who we are, how we were created and what we were, how we were created to be. Uh, for the ancient Hebrew people, this holiness was rooted in observance of the law of Moses, which then wasn't just the Ten Commandments. It was it was um, amplified into all of the, the the greater law of Moses. But the essence of it was based on holiness, on doing what was good and right and true. And his holiness was especially created to protect the most vulnerable in society. So when God's people were called to delight in the law, they were called to be protective of each other and to be looking out for what is good and right and true, not just to use the law to bolster their own um, priorities or their own privileges or their own desires. <clears throat> Once that started happening, then the law became unholy. And indeed, that was much of what Jesus was trying to strip back, that it's not so important that you do these teeny tiny little things in this particular order, but that you respect the holiness of all and that's what the the judges the prophets the mediators throughout the history of uh, god's people have been calling us back to um, time after time the sense of recognizing holiness i've been thinking of this call to holiness in terms of the holy spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, as it, or the fruits of the Spirit, as it's called in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. These traits within us as humans that particularly show God's holiness. These traits that show that God's Spirit is working through us. Perhaps you'll remember the list of these. It goes love, joy. Peace, kindness, patience, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Say those again. Love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Think a little bit about those in more particular. In essence, love, the first one becomes the law. Not our personal preference, not a familial power, but understanding that in looking out for each other through patience and kindness and gentleness, these become our ways of working. These become our ways of establishing a holiness in our relationships. So patience. Patience grows as we absorb God's sense of time. It's often said that there are two types of time. There's chronological and there's kairos. So in the chronological times, things happen in a certain order. And it's often neat and organized. And we know what's going to happen at a particular time. And that gives us a sense of expectation, but also a sense of control. But that's not how God always works. Often, more often, God is working in the kairos time. So a particular moment when the time is right. And sometimes it takes a very, very long time to happen. So the coming of the Messiah, waiting for thousands of years for the time to be right. Or something that happens in a split second and suddenly we know, ah, yes, that's exactly what we've been waiting for. Patience also develops when we recognize that the arc of history is long as as Martin Luther has said, Martin Luther King has said, 
The arch of history is long, but it always reaches arches towards goodness, towards holiness. Like Moses, we may not see the promised land ourselves, but we can keep working towards it so that the the whole community of God will reach the promised land in God's good Kairos timing. So love and patience and kindness. Kindness comes from recognizing the worth of others and the struggle of others. And sometimes we're so wrapped up in our own needs and our own struggles that we can't see what is happening with others. The root of the word kindness is actually recognizing that we are all of one kind. As one elderly woman in a congregation put it one time, Bonneville, I realize everyone's got their struggles. She had realized that we're all of one kind. We all struggle. And then we become kind in the other sense when we can commiserate with others in their struggles and also when we can celebrate with others in their achievements. And sometimes it's hard to celebrate in others' achievements because we think, ah, well, what about me? Shouldn't I be, shouldn't I be recognized as well? But a kindness means that we can, again, rejoice with each other. We can struggle with each other. We can commiserate with each other. So love and patience and kindness, and then there's self-control. <laughs> self-control emerges when we realize that the world does not resolve around our own demands, that each of us has an innate worth, but that worth is no larger, no smaller than that of the others. And our self-control can grow out of knowing that God loves each of us, and that's enough. We don't have to control the others. Moving on to gentleness, gentleness becomes a tool we use in building our relationships. Gentleness does not mean weakness. I remember hearing a definition of the word gentleman that said, a gentleman is one who knows his power and how to use it gently. In the law of love, we recognize the power that each of us has, the power that is ours to use for what is good and right and true, what is holy, and to do it in such a way that the other is free to accept our contribution or reject it, much with the, as much as like the gentleness with which God offers the covenant to us. Generosity grows out of our awareness that God has given us what we need. Our generous God has even given us more than we need so that we can share generously with others as God has shared with us. And in so doing, we build up a holy community. Faithfulness is a trait that the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, continually assign to God that God is faithful and God is good and right and true, even when others are not. Faithfulness at times can mean overlooking bad behavior, can recognize that perhaps there's a problem lurking behind, which is making this person act in a way that doesn't seem right. Faithfulness can, in that sense, excuse bad behavior. But at the same time, faithfulness means holding each other accountable to the very best of our behavior with each other. We become more faithful as we develop God's ability to look beyond the initial um, argument, the initial dispute, and look behind and see what is it that where one or both of us are hurting and how can we resolve that situation. Each of these speaks to that saying that says it will be good in the end. And if it's not good now, it's not the end. So we keep working towards holiness. We've also listed peace. And peace is the product of gentleness and kindness and self-control and faithfulness. Again, peace is not achieved by beating the other into submission. But in peace is not achieved by asserting our right or our might. 
but peace is achieved by helping ourselves and each other recognize and honor goodness. And joy then comes through peace and through the working through of the struggles into goodness, again, into holiness. As I've said, this call, this offer from God to be in a covenant relationship with God is an awesome privilege and a responsibility. In effect, God is offering us to be co-creators with God in God's peaceable kingdom. It's not a new age mantra to look within ourselves and be all that we can be. It's an invitation to be linked up with something much, much greater. Be linked up with God who created the whole of the universe, to be linked up with God's power, which actually is a big relief because it's not up to each one of us to, to do it all on our own, but it's up to each one of us to be linked up with God's power and so to be linked up with all that is good and right and true. The covenant prayer that is part of our covenant liturgy speaks specifically of this tapping into the fullness of God. We will be saying this prayer in a few moments, committing ourselves again to listening hard to what God has for us to do or not do, what tasks God needs us to be involved with or what tasks God needs us to set aside, what relationships God needs us to repair or perhaps establish. What challenges God needs us to address. Again, not that we can do any of this on our own. And in fact, to do it completely on our own would be to ensure failure. But we are to do it with God, listening carefully to God every step of the way in what we are to do next and to whom, with whom we are to share the task with whatever small or big challenge to be addressed and when, and where, and how. As much as it feels great to have done something on our own, it feels even better to have done it with God's help, to be part of something much bigger than our own selves. It's not easy in the beginning, this holiness journey. Sometimes some of us come with too much self-confidence or not enough. And both can be hard to work with. We can come also with too much confidence that God will do everything and or too little confidence. And again, that can be rather disastrous. The covenant says that we will be working with God and that is enough. Though it's not easy in the beginning, sometimes it does get easier with practice, though the task often get harder is my observation. Like the ancient Hebrews, we acknowledge that we need to go through this annual review, to go through the liturgy and the words again, to see how we measure up, to see if we've moved forward since the past year, to recognize where perhaps our shortcomings are, to realize that the task is never fully done, but we keep moving forward. We keep moving onwards to perfection, which really is the essence of holiness. If we are fully holy, we are fully perfect. And again, none of us probably will reach that state in this, in this life. But we keep working towards it. We keep working, especially with God, to make us into God's holy people, full of goodness and truth and righteousness. So be it with us in this year of 2024. So be it with us. Amen. We're going to sing together now, Take My Life and Let It Be.
make my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I'll be reading again the covenant introduction, which I read a few moments ago, and then going into the prayers of confession. God made a covenant with the people of Israel, calling them to be a holy nation, chosen to bear witness to his steadfast love by finding delight in the law. The covenant was renewed in Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his life, work, death, and resurrection. In him, all people may be set free from sin and its power and united in love and obedience. In this covenant, God promises us new life in Christ. For our part, we promise to live no longer for ourselves, but for God. We meet, therefore, as generations have met before us, to renew the covenant which bound them and binds us to God. Let us then seek forgiveness for the sin by which we have denied God's claim upon us. Let us pray. God of mercy, hear us as we confess our sins. For the sin that has made us slow to learn from Christ, reluctant to follow him, and afraid to bear the cross. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. For the sin that has caused the poverty of our worship, the formality and selfishness of our prayers, our neglect of fellowship and the means of grace, and our hesitating witness for Christ, Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. For the sin that has led us to misuse your gifts, evade our responsibilities, and fail to be good stewards of your creation, Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. For the sin that has made us unwilling to overcome evil with good, tolerant of injustice and quick to condemn, and selfish in sharing our loves with others, Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. And the covenant prayer which we recite together, have mercy on me, O God, in your constant love. In the fullness of your mercy, blot out my offenses. Wash away all my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Give me the joy of your help again and strengthen me with a willing spirit. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, to all who truly repent, this is his gracious word. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. We will sing together now the hymn that Charles Wesley wrote for the covenant service. Come, let us use the grace divine and all with one accord in a perpetual covenant join ourselves to Christ the Lord. Oh, oh, oh. 
continue with the covenant prayers. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us again accept our place within this covenant, which God has made with us and with all who are called to be Christ's disciples. This means that by the help of the Holy Spirit, we accept God's purpose for us, the call to love and serve God in all our life and work. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honor, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and material interest, and others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. In others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make this covenant of God our own. Let us give ourselves to God, trusting in God's promises and relying on God's grace. Eternal God, in your faithful and enduring love, you call us to share in your gracious covenant in Jesus Christ. In obedience, we hear and accept your commands. In love, we seek to do your perfect will. And with joy, we offer ourselves like new to you. We are no longer our own, but yours. Can you join with me now? I am no longer my own, but yours. Your will, not mine, be done in all things, wherever you may place me, in all that I do and all that I may endure, when there is work for me and when there is none. When I am troubled and when I am at peace, your will be done. When I am valued and when I am disregarded. When I find fulfillment and when it is lacking. When I have all things and when I have nothing. I willingly offer all that I have and am to serve you as and where you choose. Glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. May it be so forever. And let this covenant now made on earth be fulfilled in heaven. Amen. We will sing together, O oh Jesus, I have promised.
prayers as we of intercession, as we have entered this covenant, not for ourselves alone, but as God's servants and witnesses, let us pray for the church and for the world. Loving God, hear us as we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Make us all one that the world might believe. Inspire and lead all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Establish justice and peace among all people. Have compassion on all who suffer from any sickness, grief, or trouble. Deliver them from their distress. We praise you for all your saints who have entered your eternal glory. Bring us all to share in your heavenly kingdom. And now let us pray in silence for our own needs and for those of others. Lord our God, you have helped us by your grace to make these prayers. And you have promised to Christ our Lord that when two or three agree in his name, you will grant what they ask. So answer now your servants' prayers according to their needs. In this world, grant that we may truly know you, and in the world to come, graciously give us eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we come to an end to this covenant service, I hope that you will find some personal way to make this covenant a reality for you. One of the ways that I learned to do as a child with my father, who was a Methodist minister, he would ask us during the covenant service to write down something on a piece of paper, something that we wanted to work on in the coming year to make our covenant, our own covenant with God, more real, more lasting, more enduring. In a way, it's a bit like making a New Year's resolution. But it's more than that. It's not just a list of things we're going to try to do. But it's a way that we're going to enable ourselves to be in closer communion with God. Now, in my dad's uh, tradition, he would have us write these on a piece of paper. And then he would have a large cauldron that he would bring to the church. And he would put a candle in it. And he would invite us um, to come up one by one and put our paper into the cauldron and it would catch fire and it would burn up. You might ask, what's that about? It was a symbolic way of saying that this is a covenant not to be shared with everyone, but a covenant between ourselves and God. And that in this way, we were making it special. Um, now, of course, health and safety in today's world says that we probably shouldn't be doing this burning cauldron of paper in the middle of the church anymore, or even in our own homes. But um, I heard of one minister who does it with a shredding machine. <laughs> Whatever. I'm thinking perhaps you'll find a way that you want to write something down in some way and then maybe burn it, uh, maybe do something with it. You might want to keep it, but in a private place where you will only be the one that sees it. To be a reminder that we are in covenant with God. It's not just us trying to make ourselves better, but us working with God in this relationship. So my prayer for you in 2024 is that we'd like to say have a happy new year, but what I want to say is have a holy new year. And be aware of the ways that God will be working with you and that you can work with God be aware of the situations where God calls you perhaps to be more gentle, more patient, more understanding, more generous. And the ways that God will continue to increase your own joy, your own love, your own peace, your own goodness. That's my prayer for you. Amen. Amen.